this week, Amanda Berlin and Lee Brotherston from what? What does that say? <laughs> Why did you guys put the teleprompter so far away, dude? Where's your glasses? Well, wealth simple. Our special guest for this evening, <laughs> our good friend Farah Mavatuna from NetSparker, will deliver the technical segment. And in the security news, we're going to talk about stuff. Oh, that stuff I have here, and I can actually read it. Um, X NSA director says that we should never hack back. Uh, many are, including Marissa Mayer, are summoned before the Senate for a hearing on the breaches, not just Yahoo breaches, but multiple breaches. Mr. Robot was kind of interesting. There was some name dropping that we'll talk about. And Microsoft DDE attacks. Those are fun. <laughs> Can't wait to talk about that. Uh, no jail time for a botnet creator because he promised to go straight, apparently. I don't know what sexual preference has to do with getting out of jail. Anyway, um, hacking of fingerprint biometric, stealthy POC, uh, PLC hacks, and hackers were hired for a year-long DDoS attack against a former employer. All that and more on this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Azadorian. Excited to be here, as always, on Paul's Security Weekly. Hi, and welcome to the show. I totally introduce our host right now, but I've got a totally awkward boner. What? We're... Oh, hey! I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> and we'll at least have one person listening. That's right. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah I, I know. And I appreciate it, and I, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed your spooning with Jeff. But, uh, you know. Hey, that's... actually built the new office. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, third baby on the way, so I needed a new office. Nice. I, I, I lost my old office. That's now the baby room. Brought to you by... Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide, so there's no need to send staff to off-site training. Their team solution provides access to a supervisor portal for full control over your team's training schedule and group analytics. Go to itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and use the code SW30 to try it free for seven days and receive 30% off your monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. To learn more about IT Pro TV's team solution, sign up for a free demo of their supervisor portal. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never-before-seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. And welcome to the show! But first, let me introduce you to a guy that's jumped naked on the bed with that guy that works with Craig on the Q4 push, Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, <laughs> to... That's my claim to fame, really. Uh, Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 536. It is, in fact, Thursday, November 9th, 2017. And I am excited about the show because there is a lot of exciting things going on with those hosting the show with me. For one, we have someone who's never been in studio for a show, ever. And has hosted Ever. lots of shows with us. To my left, mi- there is none other than Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. It's exciting it's to be here. It's weird. weird. It's so uh, cool. And it's and it's not, it doesn't even look like Santa Claus in a can of Jello. I'm not. No. Yeah, no Jello. Santa yeah, can like, Jello. No je- oh, we it's totally. It's not as awkward as I thought it was going to be. No, you this know? is comfortable. It's only because I'm, he's not sitting on your lap. I'm, I, yeah. I showered. Just so we're clear. It's good with soap. I use soap. It's soap. So we're okay <laughs> in lots of places. You've got boys. You have to ask. <laughs> Maybe they're not old enough. <laughs> Did you take a shower? Yes. Did you remember to use soap? Soap. 
<sighs> Did you go, back? <laughs> go, go back. Go back. See, I don't have that problem. I have a 10-year-old girl. Go shower. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and like 45 minutes. Yeah. Like, have you the, washed your the, hair yet? The like, hot water must no? be done. <laughs> no, we have, we have a 50-gallon hot water tank because we have a hot tub. So, no, but, that's good. Yeah. Mr. Larry Pesci is here. I am. With it's, us. It's been a couple of weeks. You're in the, the evil crime lord chair. Tonight. Yes. Yes. Nice. And, and I will apologize that I do not get to drink my drink with my pinkies out tonight because, well. So you got some kind of injury going on. Yeah. There. This is the karate injury from a month ago. Oh. Mm. Still healing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That works out for you. Uh, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> uh, I mean, it makes it makes it hard to do the stranger because. Uh, yeah, you can't. Can't show me your wonderful hand gestures. Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, when I mean, heals. I'll give you the thumbs up, but. <laughs> <laughs> give up. <laughs> On the lines via Skype, I I'm so excited. The triumphant return of none other than Mr. Jeff Mann. Oh no, wait. Yeah, well, Jeff's here too. Jeff, welcome <laughs> to the show. <laughs> Well, because they're on the same Skype machine, so I couldn't introduce them. I had to. Jeff is here. Jeff, it's wonderful to have you. You've been on Skype and in studio, and you're awesome. So, yes, and here. and Kevin has been not here for way too long because he's just giggling like a, a schoolgirl Ke- for not everything Kevin that goes on. Is actually so he's here still with doing us. It. He is here with us. Not Kevin. Um, it's so nice to have you back. Well, it, thanks for well, thanks for allowing me to come back after my my sabbatical on the internet. I heard you were uh, kidnapped by ninjas, apparently. Yeah, uh, clown ninjas. Twice. Twice. <laughs> In between there, you you joined a cult or something. I... Yeah, cult of uh, cult of good Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! Tell me Bro, more. I know, huh? <laughs> tell me yeah. more. Oh boy! <laughs> I subscribed. I'll subscribe to your newsletter. <sighs> oh, you'll get it. No, no, no matter if you subscribe or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I miss. I miss Kevin's quick wittedness. It's nice to have you back. Uh, make sure you do two things for us: subscribe to our mailing list at securityweekly.com forward slash insider. You can get all the exclusive updates. All of your awesome invites to all of the awesome webcasts that we do. And we've got some special things that I think we're going to pull off next year. It's been a good week of planning. Yeah, I mean, so the webcast program, like, there wasn't a whole lot of, like, John Strand and I were just like, we're going to do webcast. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, we're going to do webcast. And we did a lot of webcast. And then people were like, wow, can we get a little less email about webcast? <laughs> and we're like, you know, we should probably do some planning. So if you're subscribed, there there is a plan to not uh, oversubscribe people. But I do thank everyone who's who's been joining. It was an awesome webcast we did today uh, with Doug White and Jonathan. Yeah, Sanders. that was a that was. Want to learn about file systems. That's yeah. the webcast for you. And be entertained, nice. right? Edutainment. And it's edutainment, it, it for sure. It was packed, and it was fun to listen to. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it was fun. It was good. So, uh, and then you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, because the other thing we do here is, like, we have lots of other shows, such as Startup Security Weekly that uh, Michael and I uh, co-host together. Well, mostly Michael hosts. I just show up and, and have fun and <laughs> talk shit. I was going to say really. the other way. It's kind of what I do. Uh, Michael does all the hard work of prepping for that show and uh, talking to startups and, and, and bringing them on the show, which is great. Uh, we've got Enterprise Security Weekly with John Strand and myself. Secure Digital Life with Doug White. I mean, it's a blast. I, how do you how do you put into words the Doug with the Doctor Doug White like his? Well, it was great because I got to meet Doug today because yeah. he was on that webcast. And what I loved was it's the same Doug White you see on Secure Digital oh, Life. Oh yeah, I mean, just a few more swears in real he, life. He's taller. Yeah, he's taller. And, and I'm probably shorter than people expect. <laughs> um, but. Uh, He's on his way out, and we got talking about artificial intelligence. And like an hour later, he's like, "Oh, yeah. I guess I probably got to go now." So I almost got him on the program tonight to be here with us. You're mm-hmm. close. You're close. Try harder next time. I'm trying. Hack Naked News. So all of those you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to all of our shows. There's more new shows being created. You'll hear more about them. Okay. Now on to our feature interview for the program. Amanda Berlin is here. She's a senior security analyst at. Networks Group, co-host of Breaking Down Security Podcast, who is it's my favorite podcast when when Amanda's on, and uh, has been and uh, no no disrespect to the others on the show, I just like it when Amanda's on the on the program. Uh, she's been an IT professional for over 13 years. She spent over a decade in different areas of technology and sectors, providing infrastructure support, triage, and design. She is the co-author of the Defensive Security Handbook: Best Practices for Securing infrastructure and we'll, we'll introduce the lead next but amanda welcome to the program 
Hey guys, how's it going? It's going. That was like yeah. the best intro I've ever had. Oh, that's that's very flattering. Thank you. you. Want, Paul uh, yeah. can travel with you if you want. That's right. I could. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would like to have somebody, you know, just introduce me every time I walk into a room. You know, that's that's my goal in life. Garcon, just, Garcon come introduce me. <laughs> just get that like get that video clip on your phone and just be like, hey, here's who I am, and it can just be me talking. It's cool. Uh, Lee, Perfect. <laughs> Lee Brotherston is a security specialist at. What, what I can't read that. Is it Wealth Simple? <laughs> yes, it is. Is that a shower curtain behind you? Yes, it is. Okay, just checking. Uh, <laughs> Lee, has, Lee has worked within information security for over a decade. In that time, he has. I can, hear the, pro- I can he, hear the production guys in the back room roaring. He's hanging out in the back because, because they know. Our set isn't much better. <laughs> Our set is exquisite. Well, I have a story about the, the shower curtain. Well, set. What, cool. what this means is he's sitting on the commode. It could be. Uh, <laughs> Lee has held, uh, positions uh, in the bathroom, as well as ranging from hands-on <laughs> practitioner through management with an overall responsibility for information security in multiple organizations. He's spoken on topics ranging from malware analyst to network security and surveillance. Lee, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I just I'm waiting for like someone to like peek out and be like, "Hey, can you grab me a towel?" <laughs> <laughs> we we at one time did have a set that uh, it was actually curtains, but people thought they were shower curtains, and we just kind of went with it. It's the shower curtain set. It was for our cigar podcast uh, where we had to go to my workshop, which had like all tools hanging up and stuff. So to, to cover that up, I put up a, essentially shower curtains. So, dude, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's cool. Yeah, this, except this one really is a shower curtain. That's right. It's actually a shower behind there, which is kind of nice. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so I, I, I want to go back to Amanda for a moment. Amanda, I, I want to ask you and Lee both the same question. Uh, you can go first. Uh, alphabetically, your first name is first. Let's just say that's the, the reason. Ladies first, you're a gentleman. <laughs> Ladies first, that too. Uh, Amanda, how did you get your start in information security? Oh, gosh. It's a uh, it's – I mean, I, I think it's a start that a lot of people have. You know, I started in the help desk. Um, I had planned on going into the Marines and – uh, was one of those teen pregnancies gone wrong. So <laughs> I, sk- I skipped the Marines, um, went in, I, I decided, you know, I'm really good at computers, so I'll go ahead and go to college for that, work my way through help desk at ISPs, at healthcare, um, started studying uh, for like Microsoft and Cisco certifications, and then security just kind of fell into my lap when I was doing, you know, sysadmin and net admin stuff. And then I just started focusing on that the last four years or so. What was your first certification? A plus. Okay. Yeah. And is that where you'd, where if somebody came to you now, they're in high school, they're interested. Where would you tell them to start? No, hold on, back up. I'm sorry. Don't talk about certifications because the way Amanda got started is how I recommend that people get started. And you said it, you started at the help desk learning how stuff works, right? Mm-hmm. And it, 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 that's the best way I think to start is, is help point. desk and like sysadmin stuff. Mm-hmm. You just mm-hmm. understand how how everything works and uh, that not everything not, not every security solution that's out there can be implemented in enterprises. That kind well, of and stuff. you have to learn so, how to talk to people too. And, and yes. if they're calling the help desk, it's not always like, how are you today? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Everything's working perfect. I can't wait to talk to you. They're not typically happy when they're right. calling you. Right, right. And working help desk at a hospital, you're always dealing with doctors, which uh, they, lots of type A personalities. Yes. So you really have to learn how to handle them. Yeah, my, my other one on the doctor side was uh, 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 working help desk with lawyers. And uh, also working help desk with higher educators. Mm. And the best part was when you had lawyers who are higher educators. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Those were <laughs> almost, almost as bad as doctors. Uh, Lee, uh, how did you get your start in information security? Uh, it's not completely different. Um, I did the usual go to school, go to university route, and then got a job at a local ISP. And uh, it was a tech support slash sysadmin slash network guy. Uh, and exactly like you said, spent time on the phone, spent time debugging Cisco, sent, spent time messing around with desktops and whatever, and then uh, turned out to have an aptitude for security and kind of fell into it from there. And when it, with, uh, I'm of the vintage where there weren't really InfoSec degrees so much, so uh, uh, that wasn't really a route in at that time. You know, when you say aptitude, one of the things I've always found fascinating is that 
uh, I've often described, we don't see the world the same way. So when you say right. aptitude, like how would you explain the aptitude? <laughs> That's a command in Debian that I run to update packages. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, so, um, yeah, it's things like naturally thinking, oh, this, thinking through how something works and how you might abuse that or make it act in a way that it shouldn't. And I think not everybody thinks that way. It's like um, people that look at locks and think, oh, there's a way to break into that or look at um, business processes and there may be a way to circumvent it or laws or whatever. And this is the technology equivalent. You look at how things function and think I may be able to make it work in a way it was not intended. And uh, yeah, I did that and it transpired to work out. Was that a natural mindset for you? And when you were you surprised when other people don't think that way? Um, I think it's fairly natural. I mean, I played with computers a lot as a kid, um, and there was a lot of trying to work out how things worked from the point of view of uh, just trying to get stuff to work. Uh, you know, back when you were cobbling machines together from, like, computer fairs and whatever, and then maybe semi-legit software you're trying to get to run properly and that kind of thing. Um, and then when you're in the workplace, uh people have been very much sort of conditioned that this is the way you do a thing and 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 that's it um and i think that security people generally have a but what if i try this what if i try that let's see what that does kind of attitude and and you know sort of notice that you can affect things in different ways now i want i want to ask you both uh, amanda and lee uh, we'll, we'll talk about the book in a little more detail but at some point, you collected experiences that led you both to co-author a book on <laughs> that you titled the Defensive Security Handbook. So, what experiences in your career were the most helpful or influential that eventually led up to you writing the book? Um, definitely, time and time again, walking to walking into um, an enterprise that everything was broken and everything was on fire, um, and working through. Uh, you know, creating a more stable and more secure environment over and over again. <laughs> nice. Lee, how about for yeah. yourself? Uh, for me, I think it was a combination of two things. I did a, I did do a period of time where I was consulting, uh, and I've also been like the first security person in uh, in a company. Uh, and one of the working titles that I had on the book uh, was uh, "Surprise! You've inherited a security department," <laughs> which I, which uh, I really didn't go for. But um, yeah, it's the a lot of companies seem to get the oh, we've got to this size and. Perhaps we should do a security, and uh, and then they sort of stop there and go, wait, how do we do that? And that was kind of the thinking was that the book would fill that "what do we do next" kind of gap. Wow, I wish I, I wish yeah, I had that book when I yep. started. At, similarly, like you're the security person, right? Now how did you guys? I, I got the book. I got the pamphlet of poof. Now you're a manager. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got a pamphlet. <laughs> I did. That's I pretty, had to find it on the internet myself. That's though. Pretty, pretty high tech. <laughs> how did you guys meet? To, to right, I mean, writing a book is not an easy task by yourself with a partner. Uh -oh. So did you guys know each other beforehand? And was this one of your crazy ideas? Or how, tell us how you guys got together to write the book. Um, I think we both had the idea at around the same time because our publisher actually introduced us to each other. Okay. Mm. We, we were writing for probably three or four months before we actually met in person. That's wow. awesome. Wow, you, you were writing a book and you met your co-author in person? Wow, right. it was like, it was like yeah. I mean, we, two we or Skyped and stuff, three but... hours before we met in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh boy. Uh, so um, when I look at the title, uh, well, so where I wanted to start actually was uh, a little bit of marketing about the book because somehow you've convinced uh, most security people on Facebook to hold this book up and take a picture, and I want to know. <laughs> How you, from a social engineering perspective, were able to do that because I think it's marketing genius. Yeah. I, I have absolutely no idea why people started doing it, but I I, uh, I have this book, you know, because you're writing the book and, you know, it doesn't seem super real. Um, you know, it's it's all online. We're, we're writing it in O'Reilly's, you know, custom, horribly written writing app. And... Um, you know, I, I finally get this box of books, and it becomes a little bit surreal. So I just took a picture of myself holding up the book, mm -hmm. and it just kind of snowballed from there, and everybody started doing it, and it was the best marketing ever. 
That's uh, yeah, that's awesome. Like I, I, I actually don't have a copy of the book. I'm gonna purchase one. Look, send look me at one. me, gonna, Paul. Look at me. I'm gonna look purchase one and and put a picture up on. Yeah, and uh, not, not Kevin. Not Wait. Kevin just got up from his desk, so I suspect he's going I to get his copy, get of, the copy book of it. Yeah, yes. as well. So uh, <laughs> he's stealing it from like a coworker or something. <laughs> so we'll have to we'll have to pan he's back to them the, the Skype it's call. It's not Kevin. It's not. Kevin. Yeah, we'll have to pan back to the Skype call. I don't know who took the book, but it's not Kevin. And going back to like the the beginning of my security career, uh, I think Kevin actually taught one of the first security classes I ever took. Wow! Look at that. We come full circle. Yep. Um, We're good so like that. What, what types of when I see defensive security handbook, like I'm like, wow, you guys bit off a lot, <laughs> right? Like there's a lot. <laughs> you a lot of places you could go. Uh, I've thought myself like what a handbook would look like. Um, and just deemed it like I'm like I, I don't know I don't know if I could do that, but you you folks were ambitious and and did that. So what what are some of the foundational elements? I mean, obviously it's not hey go buy all these security solutions and hey you know you're you're secure, right? I guess that would be more like a cookbook rather than a handbook. Uh, but given that it's a handbook, there are what what are the foundational elements? Um, I think the main thing we did was we broke it down into the main areas. So there's 21 chapters, and each chapter covers a high-level area. So there's one that's policies, one that's vulnerability management, one that's patching, um, that kind of thing. Um, so they don't deep dive any of them. You won't be a subject matter expert in vuln management because, you know, it's a chapter. But it should give enough of a flavor for people to realize if it's uh, something they want to do and if they should go and read further on a topic. Uh, so they're all kind of standalone in that sense. Um, and we've tried to give recommendations of what to do, but like you said, it's not all blinky box stuff. So we haven't gone and recommended a bunch of commercial solutions. There are a number of open source and free items available, and we've given suggestions on the sort of criteria you might want to look at, but we haven't prescribed this is what your security program looks like. It's more, you should think about vuln management, you should have uh, Active Directory configured, you should patch Unix boxes, et cetera, et cetera. And so it sounds like, I mean, you guys have a lot of experience. So it sounds too like when you're writing a handbook like this, you're not trying to write it for the handbook for 2017, and maybe it'll apply in 2018. So did you right. have to go back and forth and, and really think about your collective experience to say, these are things that we've come across pretty much consistently for the last decade, and we can see them being challenges for the future? Right, yeah, I think so. I mean, taking um, vuln management and patching for a second, uh, I worked as a consultant, and part of that was doing instant response, and the number of incidents that are simply like terrible configuration and patching. Um, I think that a lot of people focus a lot on worrying about all the zero days and all the blinky boxes, and if they just got the basics nailed, I think a lot of organizations would be way better, and that's kind of the approach we were taking. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Michael. Nope. Your turn. No, I, I, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll comment yeah. then. I think I think that's absolutely right, and I think maybe nowadays the uh, the barrier for that that the basics maybe has increased a little bit, uh, but still not all that much. I still think the basics are there. Well, and what I like about it, right? And I I think I've said this on the show, and I've certainly chatted about this with you guys. If somebody says the basics, I always go, "What do you mean?" But what I like is you've you've taken the time to distill that. So right. it, at least now we got a list. You know, and, and 21 yeah. chapters, that might be a lot. But if you're thrust into that position and you're trying to figure out which way is up, it sounds like a really good starting point for somebody to read it, get their head wrapped around it, and then figure out where to go. That, that's there was so much that's something a lot of that. us would have liked. There was so much innuendo <laughs> in that. I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of thrusting and make sure you're going the right way and head. And <laughs> Sorry, I'm all for it was, it was a lot of thrusting. <laughs> Whew, um, I'm all sweaty now. <laughs> <laughs> but you feel good, right? I, do, I mean, what's not to feel good about? <laughs> well, but my job here is done. Of, of those 21 topics, um, which ones are, are most difficult for people to, to grasp and, and actually implement? Uh, my top one is asset management, hands down. Mm, that's a good one. I've, I've never seen it done correctly. Hmm. I've heard I've heard of people doing it correctly. I've just never seen it done correctly. But on the internet, right? So there's unicorns. Yeah, is what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, Lee. How about for you? Um, what's the hardest? I don't. I honestly, I think um, I think just having patching sorted is still seems to be ridiculously hard for people. I think recent news would bear that out. 
Uh, well, I think, you know, having patches to apply is, is uh, important, too. <laughs> well, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, so on the on the on the same topic, I always find when you write, you learn, there, and there's always some surprise. Mm-hmm. What was the biggest surprise? And we'll stay from a subject matter perspective. So you set out, you had outlines, you worked back and forth, you, you're you're writing, and a lot of times you you make a connection you didn't have prior. You come up with a new a new insight. What were the insights that each of you took out of writing this book? That that at the end you went, oh, that's more important, less important. I don't know what what uh, what bubbled up in the process of of creating this handbook. Oh gosh, um, I want to say I probably learned probably learned the most doing um, the compliance and and um, uh, framework chapter. Uh, I just didn't I didn't realize all the little nuances and and the other small uh, compliance uh, standards that were out there like uh, uh, FERPA yeah. and and that kind of stuff that a lot of people need to worry about. That I I never had a thought I I never had to think about I was always concentrated on PCI and HIPAA. But wait, it says it's the Defense of Security Handbook, not the Defense of Compliance Handbook. Aren't those two separate <laughs> separate things? There's only one chapter on compliance, though. Oh, okay, that's good. And, and it's Phew. just kind of explaining them. It, it was one of the one of the most difficult ones to write. I, I think. Bet. I bet. Nobody likes PCI. Nobody likes no. compliance. <laughs> Well, no, there, no, 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 no. There, there are people. There are people that like PCI, Jeff. That's true. I was, yeah. I was, that's exactly what went through my head. And Jeff, we and love. And we made sure to uh, put a. It. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we made sure to put an emphasis that you know in, in the beginning of that chapter that you should focus on it, which everybody always says. Right. <laughs> we're we're going to write about compliance. By the way, here's the first rule: don't, you don't go ahead focus. and ignore so, it. Don't focus on security. So I have a question. Yes. If I may. Yeah, I'm shocked. We finally got Jeff in the yeah. It took you a while, Jeff. Yeah, right? Didn't, well, Jeff, you have a question and a sort of visual comment, yes? I, I do have sort of a visual comment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but as far, everyone, everyone's got the book except for you, Paul. Uh, my question is, uh, outside of compliance, PCI or otherwise, what are, in your experience from having talked to people that have bought the book, read the book, using the book, what are the drivers that you're seeing companies have for actually doing security? It's a, like either one of you. I actually think that varies a little bit based on uh, industry vertical and the maturity of the companies. So, um, some companies are in a position of trust, so especially those dealing with finance or something like that. So I think their driver is demonstrating trust uh, to their customers, that the customers can trust them to look after their information, uh, manage assets appropriately and all that sort of thing. Uh, some companies just don't want the brand reputation of a big breach. And I think some of them just honestly feel the pressure that they need to do security and they don't necessarily have a motivator other than they should be doing something. It is the content of the book, is that geared towards a particular size organization or are there elements in the book that provide advice, no matter if it's a, a small business all the way up to a large enterprise? I think it covers most sizes. I would say it's probably tailored slightly more to smaller um, organizations because the target sort of reader is someone who is IT literate, but maybe not security literate yet, or is uh, junior in security and looking to um, take on a big task like bringing a security uh, a security practice sort of up and running in an organization. Um, whereas I think a larger uh, enterprise is more likely to have people that already have the skill set you would hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't mean they have the organization because as I've been as I've been listening and and thinking some of this through. So you had 21 chapters. Are, are they prioritized? Yeah. Should somebody start at the beginning and read their way through? Should they flip through and pick out the pieces that like, oh, I've got to deal with this? Like when you, I, I suspect there's a way people will use it. But when you wrote it, what was right. the intention for how to use this? Um, we we wrote them that they should all be standalone. Um, so you can can read in any order, but we have grouped them in sort of simple foundational stuff first, moving to more advanced technical and, you know, once you've got the foundations nailed later on. So it's roughly in a 
chronological-ish order as to how you would approach it. You mentioned you use okay. some uh, open source tools. Um, which ones are, are most applicable uh, to larger enterprises? Self-serving enough because I'm potentially working on a talk on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, asking for so, a friend? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking so, for a friend. Uh, I think prime examples were uh, we uh, talked about Snort when we were talking about IDS. Um, I'll admit a bunch of the commercial solutions are based on it, but we talked about the open source version. Um, I was talking about uh, Nessus, which again, there's a, there's um, the commercial versions, but there was Nessus and sort of generic stuff like Nmap and the, and um, I've forgotten the name of it. Open the uh, other open yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. Now I feel, I feel open, dirty. I feel dirty saying that. Yeah, Just open, open vas. Open vas. What? Open vas. Yes. Vas. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Vas. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we mentioned a bunch of those, and I think uh, they may not be um, what a large enterprise wants necessarily, but they're still applicable. They can still be used. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Amanda, which chapters did you focus on and, and did you talk about uh, specific tools in your chapters? Oh, uh, I, sometimes I can't remember which ones I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, <clears throat> But uh, two of the ones that I'd like to recommend, um, one is NetDisco, which is a uh, kind of like a asset management for your switching environment, hmm. and the other one's Open Audit, just for keeping track of endpoints. Hmm. I learned about two tools I've never heard of before. Does Open Audit does that run as an endpoint agent? No, okay. it just uses uh, WMI. Oh, interesting. Do you find a lot of enterprises are using open source tools? Um, half and half, I think. Uh, if they have the budget, they usually go and buy something more expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, for smaller tasks, I think a, a lot of times they use open source or, you know, free alternatives, whatever. You know, one of the things that I see, and I'm curious if you guys see it too, is a lot of times you pointed out they may or may not have the budget. Sometimes what I see people do too is they're trying to get the budget. So they'll start mm. with something open source, they keep the scope tight, and then they come back and say, yep. wow, look at what we're able to do. By the way, I couldn't do this, this, or this, but this tool will do it. Now you can show somebody some results. Do you tend to find the same things? I would, I would also argue that um, very much you do the open source type stuff and you have a wider scope, but look at what we could do. Oh, and then yeah. management comes and says, well, great, when it breaks, who do we call for support? Well, the internet, of course. Mm. So, some of those things. Right, right. I, I, I recommend it a lot. I don't know that I see a lot of people actually doing it in practice. Um, one of the one of the tools that I don't think people use enough, at least in Windows environment, are uh, group policy. You know, there's there's so much you can do security related with group policy that people just ignore. Yeah, and so many exposures that nobody configures group policy to not have. In Active Directory. So why do they ignore it? I mean, when we when we advance stuff like this and we find that people are ignoring it, is it because it's too complicated, because they don't understand it, or because they're just simply unaware of it? Both. I think a lot of the times they're just unaware of it. I also think there's a skills gap in mm -hmm. terms of understanding Active Directory well enough to be able to configure it so that it is not inherently insecure. <clears throat> I, and I would also add on to that. I think there's also a, a gap in folks knowing their environment to know how to mm. configure group policy not that's to a great break point. something. That's a good point. And how many different group policy objects and all that stuff that they should have. Uh, I worked in an organization many years ago that said we will be and we will only be a single GPO uh, oh my God. organization. <laughs> Meaning they had one group policy project that pro process and object that applied to every device in the organization. Yikes! That because why? Sounds they, horrible. They had one guy to be able to manage it, and mm -hmm. that was across a multi-node DIS. I mean, and to Amanda's point too, I think there's a lot of Active Directory administrators that are like, "What? What's Mimi Cats again?" It's like, well, <laughs> dude, like, come on! I, I don't like cats. I can never finish yeah. a whole one. There's, <laughs> Yeah, there's issues. And we co we cover a little bit of purple teaming in there too. We have a chapter on that that kind of uh, goes over using set and Mimi cats and Nmap that kind of stuff. 
just kind of dip their toe in the water for doing offensive internally. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What's um in, in your experience and having seen many organizations, what are some of the advantages of having some commercial tools to solve some of these problems? Like what's the, what's the driver and how do you know when to implement a commercial tool to solve a problem and when to either solve it natively with the environment like Active Directory we're talking about or implement some open source or free solution? Who's up this time? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lee. Hi. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't want him to fall uh, asleep over uh, there. Amanda has has graciously allowed you to go first for oh. this for this question, which Perfect. is how. And I'll give you some more time to think about it by repeating it. When I'm faced with the decision, I've got these 21, 21 things. Um, yep. I have to solve uh, essentially twenty one problems, probably multiple problems yep. within there. How do I know when to go get a commercial tool? versus adopt some open source solution versus use the native architecture or infrastructure, live off the land as, as attackers do in order to solve the problem. Uh, how, how do I make those? What advice do you have for people to make those decisions? Um, I think there's a few areas. Um, one is budget, because that can instantly kill the option of commercial before you even start. Um, so uh, how much, yeah, the budget... Um, someone already mentioned it, but a lot of organizations, I think, uh, just want to have something that they can plug in now, have support and not need to worry about. Uh, and that often means they can go get going uh, without having to think about it too much. Um, open source stuff is great, but there's sometimes a lead time because someone needs to develop it. Uh, you know, they might need to extend what's already there, um, develop some front ends, modify things to work with an environment, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's... Uh, it, you sort of have a requirement on the skill set of the people in house to be able to run something, build something, operate something um, along with the budget. And then finally, there's the feature set. So there are just some things that you can only get in commercial tools. So if you require something that's only available in the commercial versions of something or a commercial only but something, then it's probably the best way to go. You know, I just I want to underscore a point or I guess yeah. amplify the point. It's, okay. it's that capabilities you're. I think that is so often overlooked because because to your point, we'll look at the features and or we'll look at the budget. But if you don't have the capabilities to make that work the way you want to, then that's your limiting factor. And right. and either you have to solve for that uh, or let it go and move to what, what you can do uh, with the skill sets that you currently have available to you. I, I think it's a really important point. And the reason I bring that up is because we look at a lot lately of – in security, we're good sometimes at coming up with a strategy. Right? Mm -hmm. If you give me a whiteboard and I have no limitations, I'll tell you exactly how it should be. But that's not the world in which we operate. <laughs> <Tickle> and, no. <laughs> and the, the, if you look into a lot of the, the leadership research in the, in the literature now, the biggest mistake people make is they've got a really good strategy, maybe even a complex strategy, no way to implement it, and that comes down to capabilities. I think if you can have a pretty honest look at the capabilities that you, your team have, or the resources you have, whether it's, it's interns or open source support or support contracts or whatever else, I think that might be a really good thing to focus on uh, that's often overlooked. I think it's important to uh, differentiate between capability and, and, and resources because they, they relate to each other. In other words, I, I, in my assessment of many of the commercial products on the market today is that while they do, in certain circumstances, provide extra capability, oftentimes I could create or recreate that same capability using open source tools, using what's available to me in, yeah, in the architecture. And, and so keep but in the, mind the time and resources it would take me to do that and maintain it is uh, enormous. No, you, no, yeah, you're on. And just in case I, I'm not clear, it, capabilities means exactly that, right? It's the capabilities of the team, the skill sets. So do, yeah, do, I'm sorry. Do, so I, do I have features from capabilities? Yeah, yeah. But you can look at capabilities overall. And so that's a great point. Can I get this different capability by using this open source tool versus a commercial tool versus some hybrid model? But then also you have to look at, do I know how to operate it? Do, do I know how to put it into my environment? You know, any tool we use, even a commercial tool, it's going to take time. You've got to learn how to use it. You've got to learn how to act with it. And then so, you know, that's the, the risk to when we talk about starting with open source. There's a learning curve. So if you let that go too long, the cost of, of transitioning to something else gets higher. Mm hmm. So uh, if true. I may interject, I think people ignore that uh, question too. I, hold on, Amanda, and then and then Jeff. Sorry. 
Uh, I think people ignore that question or they're not as honest as they should be with that question uh, on their their own capability or their team's capability. And that's what happens when they buy a bunch of blinky boxes that just, you know, yeah, sit plugged in on a shelf. It's kind of funny, right? Because we're a pessimistic bunch, but we're really optimistic when it comes to what we can do. I'm into then Jeff. Your mic. I'm, yes. I thought I was then. <laughs> He's in Damn studio. Damn it, I got my name wrong. Yeah, I was <laughs> Jeff, you're the floor. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. He's acting very presidential. Come I'm, on now. I'm sorry, Jeff. All right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little confused with the direction of, uh, of the last uh, thread here. Um, I get the difference between sort of capabilities and resources, but what are we suggesting if, if we don't have the capabilities or the resources? Because I think you can make that argument whether it's a, an open source tool or, or if it's a commercial tool. Um, but I, I almost hear like, well, it's better to do nothing than to do something. Is that what we're saying, or are we saying hmm. buy something if you don't have the capability to automate and hope for the best? Uh, you hire, know, hire an MMS. Where is this? Hire an MMS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the way I was going with that was that um, if you don't have strong, say, dev and sysadmin capabilities in house, then the time it takes you to take that effective, what you're thinking is a free open source product to something you can use could actually end up costing more than just buying it off the shelf something um, because the amount of time you burn in headcount who are having to develop tools or um, or work with them ineffectively or whatever else. Uh, whereas if you can just go and buy a product that just works, has a support contract, comes with a consultant or whatever, um, it may actually work out cheaper. I, I, I think that uh, we haven't talked about a very important point, and that is the organization's ability to define goals for their security program right, yeah. that are very much fundamentally based on, well, what am I trying to protect? How much is it worth? Um, then developing security goals based on that, and then buying Lee and Amanda's book and developing a strategy <laughs> and making decisions based based from there. But hey, I that's think... that's the that's the first chapter is is uh, building a security program. So yeah. you know you, you don't even you have to start word... creating it yet. You use the word goals a lot. I hope. Yes. That's yes. Good. That's good. So uh, prioritizing. Just, now you can just buy the book. That's that's good. I like it. It's the first line <laughs> item, right? Everybody should have that as the line item in their budget. Let me just answer uh, Jeff's query though too, because I think it's a key point. I'm using it as a sorting function. So so capabilities is actually a, a lens of value. And if you're doing something that's increasing your capabilities, that's a really good choice. So if you're faced with, I can't do everything, then taking on something where you lack capabilities is probably not your best choice. Or you have to go source for those capabilities. So definitely, I'm not a, you know, it's funny. I would say I'm not a proponent of doing nothing over doing something, except for sometimes doing something will make it a lot worse. So I guess I'm a favor of bias for action, following the guidance of the book. But if you have to choose, I, I like capabilities as a sorting factor. Wow, so many buzzwords for this podcast. It felt good, right? <laughs> I don't really it do kind of hurt. It kind so of hurt trying. a little, but it kind of hurt a little bit only the but, first time. But then though. you settle in. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I bet you are today. <laughs> <laughs> hurt a little, and then you settled in, and then now you're good. And I'm not going to move. I, I wish you know, it's an inside joke. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little outside it's too. A little <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the studio, Michael. Good lord. <laughs> wow. I can't. I can't oh even. God. I can't I even. Lost, I just lost it. I just, I just, I lost, I lost. I'm back now. I'm back now, though. I don't even blush normally, and I'm pretty sure I'm blushing uh, right now. Oh, boy. Yeah, you kind of look like that. You blend into the chair. I'm, just, yep. uh, I'm fitting in. <laughs> top and bottom. There's, it's, an, it's an inside <laughs> joke. No, your shoes, it's, dude. It's look fine. at the shoes. It's, it's, Come just, on now. it's an inside joke. That's what they're talking about. <laughs> it's buddy. a little outside, In case too. you're trying to decipher it, 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 if you can decipher the puzzle, then Congratulations. You'll, you'll be rewarded with it. With laughter, pictures. With with pictures. Expense, you'll, be, you'll be rewarded yeah. with pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, boy! <clears throat> that's where we're pretty off the rails. I have, I have an off-topic question. Go for it, now, Kevin. I've I've read a lot of O'Reilly books over over my time, and I've always wondered: Do you get to choose the animal on the cover? Great question. <laughs> that's yeah. That's one of the most popular questions we get. So, uh, <laughs> Lee and I were actually going back and forth. Uh, for several weeks trying to decide what animal to use. And I think we took a little bit too long. <laughs> uh -oh. So so they just sent us uh, uh, the porcupine, and we're like, all right, I guess. <laughs> Was honey badger taken? You couldn't be a honey badger? Yeah, yeah. So their rules are um, you can't reuse an animal 
Uh, and it has to be real. Like, can't be a unicorn or anything. I uh, love so it. Wait, wait, hold hold on, on, yeah, hold on. Hold on. What do you mean? You mean unicorns aren't real? <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, Man, I'm this sorry is, to break this is rough. I can't and, handle this. And, all right. O'Reilly book. Cockroach. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Wait, does it is that an animal? Is That's it an, an animal or an insect? Can it be an yeah, insect? Yeah, that counts. But, yeah, I was oh, gonna say yeah. they had a okay. wasp in one of them. So yeah, yeah, yep. All right. So that said, you guys got the porcupine, but what were your two top choices? I mean, because obviously, I'm assuming there was some difference why you took some so long. Yeah, my my top choice, and I can never remember the name of it, but it's the little fish in the Amazon that will swim up your pee stream. Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard about that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to the Google. To the Google. I'm going to have to open an incognito window for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Google that. It's the, it's, the, it's the little fish in the Amazon. Lee, I'm dying, been... I'm dying to hear your choice now. <laughs> uh, I've been pushing for narwhal. In lieu of unicorn, we might as well go for sea unicorns, but no, apparently we can't have that. Oh. I thought the narwhal had been used. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was why I didn't know. Is it the kendiru? Yes, that. Yeah, is the the fish that swims up your pee hole? Wow. <laughs> yep. This is this is an adult show. You can say urethra. <laughs> <laughs> and we can keep our Except PG-13 for he rating. never knew what it was called. <laughs> no. But but I'm actually reading from the Wikipedia article, and it says up your pee hole. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so much, no, but you if it does, it's because Larry just edited it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come check the revision history on that one. It wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time. Uh, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Are you, are you both ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Is sure. anybody ever really ready? No. It just You never I prepared. Pre- I prepped. Oh. Well, uh, Lee, did you prep for the five questions? It's sort of. I thought about it a little bit. Okay. Well, that's, I, I have you know, answer. more than some. Yeah. Um, so you know how this well, works when there's, when there's two people that have to play five questions. I arbitrarily pick one person to start, uh, and then I ask them oh, the first question. Okay. And then I ask the same question to the other person. And then that person gets to answer the next question, and then I I switch back. It, it, it'll flow naturally. This? It'll it'll flow once we start. Paul will lead you through so, the process. Uh, <laughs> Lee is in the, the the preview window there, so I'll start with Lee to make it easier on our production team switching. You're welcome, Lee. <laughs> three words to describe yourself. Uh, curmudgeon in training. Amanda. Wow. Um, impulsive, uh, organized, and energetic. Amanda, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Poison, definitely. I don't like messes. The Kandiru. Lee, your weapon of choice <laughs> if you were a serial killer. Well, given the shower curtain behind me, I'm going to go with Dexter's kill bag. Yeah, very hmm. nice. Lee, if you nice. wrote a book about yourself, not necessarily security, but a book about yourself, what would the title be? I can't go with Defensive Security Handbook. That's you can't. You can't. <laughs> you can't use the same animal. you. Though. <laughs> Amanda. Uh the book title? The book title, um, yes. Um Surprise, I don't know what's gonna happen next. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I'm a chick, obviously first. <laughs> Lee. Uh second because I am not an Ask Grabby Grabby thought leader. Oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Lee, now choose two <laughs> celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional or otherwise. Uh, oh, I didn't even think of that. Okay. Uh, oh, you didn't Alex prepare Trebek. for this question. <laughs> Alex Trebek from uh, um, Jeopardy. Jeopardy and Susan Sarandon because I couldn't think of a good reason, but they seemed like an odd pairing. Amanda? I saw her in the airport once. Um, Did you? Yeah. Uh, she kind of looks Betty like me White. a little bit. Betty White. <laughs> Wow. Nice. Did she say Betty White? She did say Betty White. Betty, Betty White. White. Excellent choice. It's funny though. And uh, Dwayne Johnson. Wow. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Interesting pair. Mind blown. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a really cool Damn. pair. And then you say, well, they'd have to create. Okay. Yep. We're good. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, I'm gonna... <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amanda and Lee, thank you so much for appearing. <laughs> On Paul Security Weekly, um, you can find the book on uh, Amazon, and uh, I'll read back the uh, exact title: Defensive Security Handbook: Best Practices for Securing Infrastructure. 
The Go one by that the, book. The one with the porcupine. The one with the porcupine. And uh, Amanda is a co-host on the Breaking Down Security podcast. So make sure you go listen to that. And Lee, do you have anything that you want to plug? People can follow you on Twitter or do a blog or podcast or same thing uh, for Amanda. Uh, I'm Synac. Terrible for speaking <laughs> on uh, on Twitter. Uh, or squarelemon.com. That's got my blog. Thank you. Squarelemon. Square Amanda. And I'm Info Sister. Uh, I N F O S Y S T I R. Excellent. Thank you both. And Amanda's also the one that's running the uh, the Hacker Secret Santa this year. Yes. I am. Oh, I'm so what? excited oh, so about hold that. On. Tell us about Hacker Secret Santa. Well, do we have a, a minute or so? Uh, so I guess this is the third year I've done it. It's only the second one I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> there, was um, drugs. there was drugs involved in the first one, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, so it's just something I run where um, I take you know, anybody's information <laughs> that wants to give it to me. And, credit card, uh, the CVV number. Right, the right. And I just swap people. And this year we're up to like 140 people over 14 countries. Wow. wow. And is there a, a dollar limit? Uh, 25. 25. That's awesome. Is there a website yep. people go to to sign up for this or? Uh, I tweeted out a Google form link. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so and then word, we use the hashtag yeah. hacker Santa. So if okay. you can, you can look at last year. Some of them were really, really, uh, inventive. You know, one was like a mini CTF in a Pelican case. <coughs> wow. Um, another was like two pounds of bacon. <laughs> nice. I saw I saw yeah, a good gift, which was what, uh, a duffel bag with $500,000 in fake money. <laughs> yep. And uh and yep. uh, Amanda, I just I just heard about this new book that I recommended that Paul get for his boys, which was what, penis pokey? Oh, you uh, saw that. Yeah, this is that's a great book. Oh, that was one of the secret the secret Santa. Well no no, this is like ideas for next year. No. Oh this oh, year, this, this coming year. year. This yeah. year, yeah, the, Christmas the penis this year. the penis pokey book. I mean like, that, that's it's brilliant. like fifteen bucks, definitely worth it. <laughs> you get you ten dollars for something else too. That's I mean. right. <laughs> you could get some Penis pokey accessories to go with it. <laughs> okay. Hey, on that note, Amanda and Lee, thank you again for appearing on tonight's program. And uh, everyone go buy their book. So with that, Thanks, we can guys. Take, thank you very much. With that, we can take a short break. Come back and we'll do something else. I think it's a technical segment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll be back with something. Oh. <laughs>